<clears throat> okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Mammal Society Annual Conference Friday Night Lecture. I'm trying to start fairly promptly, mainly because although we're all relaxed and on, in the venue and uh, looking forward to an evening of pub quiz and drinks, um, we've got some online attendees who I know will be uh, hanging on waiting for the panel, so I'm just going to get started. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, hopefully by the time I finish speaking, uh, everyone will have filed in after their, after their pizza and Prosecco. Um, so we've got a fantastic event uh, tonight on a really important topic. Before I hand over to our glorious chair and panel, um, I'd like to start just uh, by recognizing the, uh, the wonderful photographers that hopefully you've been enjoying the work of uh, from the Mammal Photographer of the Year competition. Um, the exhibition, uh, if you didn't get a chance to see it um, uh, before, uh, the event, um, which is up in the dining hall, um, it will be shared prolifically uh, through Mammal Week, which I'll say more of in a moment. Um, but first, I just wanted to recognize in particular uh, the winners of this year's competition, uh, which are being announced um, this weekend for the conference. Um, so first of all, we have the wonderful uh, overall winner, The Squirrel and the Bee um, by Gary Watson. And also the uh, fa fabulous winner of the Youth Mammal Photographer of the Year competition, uh, Bo Healy, who is, I'm delighted to say, here today. And Bo, don't leave today without your prize. Um, I've unplugged the laptop there, but that'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> then we have uh, our second place and third place, uh, Stoat Kits playing by Gordon Roach and John Kelf um, and his uh, fabulous Bankful uh, capture there. And then two special categories. Uh, we had Derek Crawley, uh, as best series. I think Derek's here as well um, with this amazing series um, that is not as macabre as it looks at first sight. It is um, uh, nature in the raw uh, giving birth and the afterbirth being enjoyed by an opportunistic girl. Uh, and then we have also uh, this year for the first time we have a people's choice category uh, which was won by uh, Winter Wonderland um, by Alice White. So I just wanted to just um, recognize our winners especially and to hugely congratulate all of the highly commended photographers um, for uh, whom we have um, just a beautiful exhibition as a result uh, of their efforts um, and such a huge amount of talent on display there. So a bit of a round of applause for all the photographers. Ooh. Including, because it turns out I have another slide of photographs, um, <laughs> our best mobile phone photo. Uh, Cash Point by Ian Wood, and also uh, our um, Hibernating Brant's Bats, which was the highly commended in the best mobile phone photo category as well. So a quick round of applause for them as well, because they missed that. So before I hand over at last to our panel, just a mention as well for those of you that aren't aware, we are just two weeks away from National Mammal Week, which has moved from the autumn to the spring for the first time. It's new home, I hope, for future years as well. A really fantastic time uh, to get out and uh, spot mammals and signs of mammals. Um, and this year we'll be focusing on rediscovering the world of forgotten mammals. And that includes Homo sapiens. We're also looking at the people behind mammalogy, past, present and future. Um, so hopefully you'll all find ways to get involved with that uh, this year, um, even if it's just putting a footprint tunnel out in your own garden and seeing what you can uh, spot. That's it from me. I'm going to pass now over to um, Shenis from UK Youth for Nature, who is our fabulous chair for tonight, who will introduce the other panellists. Thank you very much. I heard yes, cool, very <laughs> nice. Okay, well, as Matt said, I'm Shenis Mustafa, and I am myself a master's student. I study the white stalks at NEP. I'm a bit of a traitor, I'm sorry. But I am also now in the Sussex Mammal Group as the event coordinator, so you guys are sort of pulling me in for that. Um, in terms of UK Youth for Nature, because so I've got to give them a proper background so you know who I am, they're a UK movement that calls for urgent action on the nature crisis, very nice. Well, I happen to do quite a bit on access to nature, Hence why I'm here today. And I do have to say, it's really great to see the really good turnout. I really appreciate that. So before we begin with our panelists, I've been asked to introduce the topic. So sit tight. So I think a commonality that brings us together is obviously mammals. And that is very nice, very good. I think it's been lovely. But also 
a dedication to conservation and protection of our natural landscapes and the species in this country. But too often, at least I feel, the social aspects that are forever intertwined with nature are sort of not addressed. They seem to be sources of conflict. They're not really addressed. There's not awareness. There's a lot of inaction. So it's quite a prevalent issue. But I say this. In this time of biodiversity crisis and nature decline, it impacts all of us. So it's not just us sitting here in this room, and I will really challenge you to think about the demographic of the people here today and just think, you know, if it question, if it affects all of us, then surely everyone should have the freedom and choice to take part in conservation. It makes sense. But to sort of unpick that and drop, you know, what is inclusion? What is it to be inclusive? Well, the simple term, if you just Google it, it's just including someone or something as part of a group or structure fostering a sense of inclusion where all identities feel welcome. Very nice. I think that's something we can, you know, understand. But to delve a little bit deeper, inclusion also means ensuring equality by bringing opportunities to those people with limited access. So what can limited access look like? What am I talking about? Well, it could be socio and economic factors. So the cost of transport, not having a car, which I think we all know in this sector is very imperative to every single job. Memberships, as today, outdoor gear, it, it all adds up. And so it sort of leads to this lack of access to, you know, training, volunteering, jobs, or the ability to network in the sector, but also feeling unsafe and unwelcome because it is a space that is dominated by the white middle class. So also having to work long hours if you have disabilities or experiencing a lack of educational opportunities. And so these are all examples of systemic discrimination of identity. So that can be, you know, gender, it can be disabilities. And, you know, they overlap and intersect with each other to dissuade and reduce a person's passion or ability to pursue a career in nature. And intersectionality is important because for each and every one of us, we all have multiple factors that make us who we are. So it's important when we make choices, we don't look at one factor. So say if I'm, you know, for example, looking to make a youth, youth summit or an event where, you know, I want young people to have opportunities, but I don't take into account the financial factors. I don't take into account people with disabilities. You then sort of end up reinforcing inequalities amongst young people. Get that? And, you know, I'm sure I'm not the first person, I won't be the last person to mention this. I'm sure some of you all heard it, that environmentalism is the second environmentalism is the second least diverse sector behind farming and moreover at least what i've seen and you know people i've spoken to sites aren't really always physically accessible and for those who are neurodiverse like myself you know accommodations for that aren't really present either so you know the interactions with nature that at a young age often spark passions that people you know they talk about when they have these talks these workshops they reminisce about it are obviously so important, but then at the same time, you have the statistic that 70% of white children go outdoors or spend their time outdoors, but it's only 56% for children of colour. So as the amazing journalist and ecologist, and I'm very proud to say my friend, Jasmine Issa Qureshi said in an article, passions and skill take time to grow and develop, time and space to explore the world around them and nurture their curiosity is a luxury that many minorities do not have. But in a positive sense, these inclusions can reach such benefits for all of us and for young people who can then end up growing up to be the next generation of adults with the opportunity to engage meaningfully, and that's really important, meaningfully with nature that will turn into a passion for conservation. That's you know, what we want. And in terms of health, it's great. It helps you sleep. It lowers your anxiety and your blood pressure and stress, which I have plenty as a master's student, let me tell you. And so this is another reason why working in this sector is lovely, isn't it? So why don't we share those benefits? Why not share and learn from different people, their backgrounds, their cultures, and different ways of perceiving nature? And after all, I should doubt that the best ideas come from an echo chamber. If I spent all my time talking to someone like me, I think I'd go crazy. So if conservation means making a collective decision on how to manage, protect, restore our shared natural resources that are fundamental to our survival, and those that we share the, the planet with, then surely the values and perspectives we bring to the decision-making process should encompass all of society and all of the beautiful differences it contains. And so I hope that wasn't too much for a background. 
And I hope that it was helpful. But obviously, we're also here today to hear to see the amazing panelists two of them who I've met before, and now I've met Dara, and I'm I'm pretty chuffed with that. So I want to hear what their thoughts are. So to introduce Dara, if you don't know, I mean you should know. You should. Dara is, and I want to get this right, a multi-award winning author. How amazing is that? Well known for their debut book, Diary of a Young Naturalist. I'm gonna flatter you. <laughs> as well as being a naturalist naturally, and conservationist from Northern Ireland, and now they're studying life sciences at the University of Cambridge. How fitting. Yeah. To take it away. Okay then. So <laughs> um, I, I, I've been completely unprepared. I do not have any slides, but um, I think whenever we think about inclusion in this field, there are a lot of things going on. And I think one of the clearest that came to me whenever I went to the RSPB AGM was that whenever I walked into that room, I brought down the average age by at least 30 years. <laughs> um, it, and I, I was just walking around and I felt um, out of place. It felt really awkward. I'm autistic. My brain was absolutely firing. I was never built for net, what this networking thing is. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and it feels alien. You don't feel welcome or, or at home. The reason that I stayed um, in conservation was specifically because I had a passion and a yearning to understand and protect the natural world. So I think whenever we think about inclusion and we think about these two main barriers, well, the first one is how do they interact with the field itself, but then also how do they get the passion? And I'm going to say this now, you cannot get a passion about something that you have no access to. Um, we see this uh, wide ranging issue if there are no green spaces near you, you are never going to be able to experience them. It takes money. Petrol is expensive. Um, it is, if there's long distances between these green spaces, you simply will not be able to access the natural world. And I think we there's also, um, I've experienced it, um, a prejudice um, against people who seem to be overly excited um, in this field. And I experienced this once as a um, young, younger self, um, whenever um, I went into a, a bird hide. Um, it was a pretty big bird hide, and it was, um, uh, so I was quite far away from them. But there was these two um, older people. Um, and I just, um, I, I'm going to be honest, I was babbling about a heron. I, I w it, I'm going to be honest. I was annoying, but um, I got um, basically shouted at and turned out of the bird hide. Um, I was basically like, um, I, I didn't want, to, uh, I was like just told, be quiet, settle down, you're disturbing us, can you go away please? And this, I was about um, uh, 11 at this point. And if I, that could have turned me straight, that could have been it. That was nearly a spark that was then almost ground into dust in that moment. Um, luckily, I then walked outside of the bird hide and looked at the heron from there. But, so it was fine. Um, but think about the way that we actually interact with the natural world. What if instead of being this um, quite horrible person, we could instead go, um, actually talk to people. If people, if there is a behavior around the natural world that's different from our own, it's possibly more useful to actually interact with it. And we all have our different ways of interfacing with the natural world based because lo and behold, we are in fact different people. Um, and so I found in that moment um, to feel that exclusion to be so very, very strong. And then as I was going forward, I found my own ways of interacting through the natural world by writing. And that was because um, I found that the people I didn't want to talk to. Um, like it, and so I think we need to 
first of all, probably develop a little bit more of an attitude about how, because like get away with the hubris and try and actually teach people about this knowledge, no matter of how they are actually interacting with it. You might find it weird, but you could possibly introduce someone to an absolute array of wildness that is so essential for our connection. Um, and so that's the first level uh, of getting passionate about the natural world. And then the second one is how we actually do conferences. Um, and I'm going to be honest, um, even this conference was incredible, but I did walk in there and nearly have a panic attack. Um, and I think um, we have all of these assumptions that we build up around um, humans based on who we are, which is natural. We can only really know ourselves truly. Um, which makes it probably essential to actually listen to what other people are saying. Um, and so, and this comes in uh, a variety of ways that are possibly more complex and I'm not a psychologist and I will never claim to be. Um, I do not understand how the human mind works slightly. Um, but I think it may, um, be whenever we're thinking about inclusion, uh, we should probably address the fact that the way that we actually talk to each other about it possibly excludes people. Um, and I think that there is very important, and I am running out of time, so I'm going to speed up. Um, <laughs> so I think my final point is whenever I think about inclusion and conservation, bringing all of these little um, my, um, miasma of thoughts around. Um, we then can think about whenever we go out, um, be joyful about the natural world, feel the inspiration to actually talk about it with other people, um, especially um, people who might be sick and tired of hearing you talk about that, um, that stoke for the 15th time. Um, because um, I think whenever we surround ourselves with the knowledge, it breeds our passion. And in the face of um, all of these restrictions, we have a, a cost of living crisis on, we cannot get access to these green spaces, having one, the passion, and two, then having the actual ability to get to the, because I cannot reiterate that point enough, we actually need to be getting to these places. And I think we are not nearly doing enough for that. And I think I'm out of time. <laughs> Joyce, oh, no, 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 go, 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 go. Right. Joyce, would you like me to introduce you? I want to fangirl over you, it's fine. <laughs> so we're going to start with Joyce, who I've, I've actually had the pleasure of interviewing as part of UK for Nature before, so I'm really thrilled. She's not only a PhD student at Cambridge, and I want to get this right, researching the application of AI to environmental risk within forest conservation. Amazing. But also the founder of At Climate in Colour, which is great. It's this online platform that makes um, climate, conserva climate conservation, do you know what? conversations, those two words, I hate them, make it more accessible and diverse. There we go, third try. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I mean, I did have a Oh, I did get a picture to keep you. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put that one. Go, go, yeah. That way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess my kind of um, um, kind of roots into the access conversation come from two very um, distinct spaces. Um, the first I'll talk about, which is kind of represented by the pictures here, which is my PhD research. I work with local communities in Ghana, which is where my family are from. Um, to understand the role of technology in forest conservation and to understand the harms that come both from conservation practice and, and then exasperated by new technologies that are entering the conservation space. Um, and so here inclusion is kind of um, the, the central part of my PhD is understanding how issues of environmental justice, um, not necessarily for communities that are um, that don't have access to green spaces or natural spaces, but for communities that are living and entwined and um, completely um, kind of living in a, in a more symbiotic um, relationship with the natural world, but the ways in which they're excluded from research on those spaces or um, from practice in those spaces. Um, and I think there's lots, lots of lessons to learn from 
that field study um, that can be kind of applied to not just academic research in the UK, but also more widely. I think one of the main ones, and I think just picking up on what you mentioned, Dara, is about knowledge. And I think that often, whether I'm talking with kind of year 10s in the UK or speaking with community members in Ghana, um, one of the least empowering uh, parts of conservation research is um, the priori prioritization of certain types of knowledge over others and that influencing the decisions that are made, who can make decisions, who has power in um, certain situations, and also just the joyful part about learning and exchanging from each other. I think often when we talk about inclusion, especially in the field, in conservation, it's um, often seen as something that's a hindrance to the research or often seen as something that um, slows down research or something that is kind of a burden that the researcher has to impart or or not a burden, but something actually that the researcher is so generous to give to the community, so generous to give them maybe the kind of day workshop or whatever to explain the research. And what I found is that actually the work is just so joyful when there is a mutual understanding that both parties have a huge amount of knowledge and can learn a lot from each other. And I think that that also happens here in the UK when I'm speaking with young people who say have interacted with natural spaces not in a very academic way just in a free way maybe they don't know the names of birds maybe they don't know the names of trees maybe they don't know the names of species or of the mammals or of anything but they feel fired up they feel excited they feel healed they feel all sorts of things in those spaces there is that kind of gap between the conversation that they feel like they can't be interested in, in, in those things or that they can't be respected in those spaces because they just aren't speaking in the same language. And in my field research, uh, we literally are speaking in different languages. Um, but luckily I can speak uh, a little bit as well. But, um, but I think that that bond, regardless of coming from massive different backgrounds um, or different lived experiences is something that's so magical about the natural world and something that is should be a point of connection, not of exclusion. Um, and so I think it's really questioning what are the assumptions that we're going into these engagements with, whether it's more research focused or whether it is, you know, going on walks or hikes or interacting with young people in the natural world or interacting with people who don't necessarily um, interact with it in the same way. How can there be a sense of humility um, that you don't have to be a certain type of person or have a certain knowledge base in order to be someone who's interested in conversa conservation. <laughs> um, but also that there's like a huge amount of opportunity to, as conservationists, learn a lot from people who aren't necessarily experts and that shift in perspective can bring us to a lot of really interesting um, research um, points of inquiry or just experiences. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit on that side. And then more on the public engagement side, I think that um, people are really excited about the natural world and people really care about the natural world. And I think that bringing space for people to feel that excitement, as Dara was saying, to feel like they don't have to change their identity or dampen themselves down or act in a way that is acceptable to a certain type of person or a, a certain middle class kind of community. Um, there are lots of great people doing work on this, like man like Taishan and Lyra on um, Instagram who are born and bred Londoners like me, who come to this work with their full selves and engage people with their full selves, maybe not necessarily from a middle class background or a private school education or at Cambridge or at some fancy institution, but actually just have an incredible love for the natural world. And I think giving space for people who don't talk in a certain way or use certain language or know certain jargon or even come from a background that's the same as you, but actually also finding joy in the way that they engage with these spaces and allowing them to act like that, allowing black people to be loud, allowing neurodivergent people to be loud, allowing people to be excited to use slang, to run around, to engage in these spaces. I think breaking down the boundaries about how we interact with the natural world um, just allows more people to feel free in these spaces and to feel um, like they belong. So yeah, what's up there?
That was amazing. Finally, we have Omar. Have you see her? It's great to see you again, because I already know Omar. Omar is a program manager for the Southeast for Action for Conservation, and they're a charity that sort of inspires young people to become uh, the next generation of environmental leaders who are also from diverse backgrounds. And it was founded in 2014 with the belief that all young people should be moved and protected to protect the natural world. So yeah, great stuff. Thanks, Shannon. Um... I'm going to apologise right now. I've got a lot of notes on my phone. Um, I will try my hardest to make sure I'm looking up at the audience like a, <laughs> a good panellist. Um, but um, yeah, as Shani said, um, actual conservation, we work with young people aged primarily 12 to 18 um, across England and Wales. Um, we uh, run a variety of programmes, which I'll be talking about. Um, each programme that we run has been worked hard on and crafted so that um, we can bring on as many young people as possible um, from all the regions that we work in. Um, so I hope that uh, some of the things I touch on today can be useful for you, whether that's in your personal life or if you work with organizations or groups, um, because getting young people involved is a really important aspect of conservation. Um, so uh, the 2023 State of Nature report um, showed that 16% of UK species um, are at risk of being completely lost. Um, and the government's monitor of engagement, the natural environment, found that fewer than 10% of young people um, regularly play in natural spaces. Uh, this is compared to almost half of children in the previous generation. These statistics are compounded by the fact that amongst young people, uh, there's a growing feeling of fear. Um, a Bath University study released in 2021 showed that 72% of young people uh, are frightened of the future. And almost half said climate anxiety affects their daily lives. It's not right, and it's not fair that young people are experiencing this. Um, and in order to tackle these feelings, it's essential we prioritize educating the next generation about these issues and the solutions. Um, in, in order to empower them to take action. And uh, if we want to do that, we want to make sure that we're getting as many young people involved um, from all types of backgrounds. So uh, Action for Conservation works with young people through our five main programs. The first is Wild Ed, which is our uh, school environmental education program that prioritizes working with schools who are in receipt of above 50% pupil premium. Um, it can be quite a challenge recruiting these schools and getting them on board. Uh, they are often underfunded, staff are heavily overstretched, um, and uh, it takes some uh, convincing to show them that this is an important thing for their young people to participate in. Once we do do that, um, we look at the environmental education we are delivering specifically to that school, um, and it's, this is important because a lot of our uh, environmental education in the UK is geared towards primary school age children. There is a focus on outdoor play. There's a focus on exploring the environment and learning about nature. Uh, and then when young people move on to secondary school, this drops off quite severely. Um, so if we expect young people to be connected to nature and to care about it, um, all the way into adulthood, it's imperative that we support them throughout their teenage years. Um, and Wild Ed Workshop is one of the ways we do that. So we teach young people about pressing environmental problems around the globe, but we also put a really good emphasis on issues within their own community. It's a really important way of getting young people to buy in to this, um, this work. We teach them about uh, issues at home. We look at things from a cultural and a historical perspective, which is often not included in these discussions, especially not with young people. Uh, and then we then task them to create solutions and take action for the environment in a way that is relevant to them and their school and their local communities. Uh, additionally, Action for Conservation hosts free residential camps um, held in the UK's beautiful national parks in each region that we work in. So I'm the Southeast manager, we get to do ours in the beautiful South Downs National Park every year. Um, camps are designed to be a truly immersive experience um, and we, get, we are supported by fantastic partner organisations. Um, our camps teach young people about environmental and social issues uh, and importantly the solutions to them. 
while simultaneously emphasizing the importance of outside fun. Um, this holistic approach um, embeds our core values of protecting nature by developing a sense of place, um, not only in space, but in time and in their memories as well. Um, we actually do have a couple of ex-campers um, in the second row here, um, who I'm sure would be happy maybe to, <laughs> to talk to anyone um, who was interested in hearing more about it. Uh, by creating an inclusive space, young people develop an affinity with natural spaces and they leave camps inspired to take action for the environment, which is great, as they are then given the chance to join Action for Conservation's year-long ambassador program. Uh, the program builds on knowledge learnt on camps and is a really brilliant way of getting young people connected to nature uh, as we look to the young people themselves to tell us the issues that they uh, would like to tackle. This allows activities to be tailored towards the curiosities of the group, which of course leads to greater interest and participation. Uh, just last Saturday, as you can see here, Southeast Ambassadors um, and alumni visited Walthamstow Wetlands, which is the largest urban wetlands in Europe. And I believe, might be wrong, might, uh, is the largest urban nature reserve in the UK. Um, they took part in a variety of activities um, that I know for a fact, some of them would have been nervous and potentially even point blank refused to do um, prior to their time at Action for Conservation. Um, the group carried out species surveys and they learned about the importance of data collection um, and carried out several forms of practical conservation, including scything, um, which was a first for every single member of the group and which they did not stop, stop talking about all the way home. Um, the risk assessment was monumental, <laughs> but it was absolutely worth it. <laughs> Um, so whilst we obviously have targets for measurable change actions and developing skills and knowledge amongst the young people, we work these into the events um, whilst creating them with the general interest of the group at heart, um, not beforehand. Um, for example, in a previous ambassador cohort, a young person was interested in sustainable skincare brands and business as well. Uh, the team was able to work with the cosmetics brand Lush um, to organize a visit to their manufacturing site in Dorset and the team gave the ambassadors a tour of the factory um, and helped the young people learn about sustainability practices and how to bring that into small businesses as well. We all want our young people to build a connection with nature and recognize that this is, does not happen overnight at all. <laughs> so accordingly, all of our programs uh, are completely free and funded in order to make sure that every young person, regardless of how they've been raised or where they live, uh, regardless of the background that they come from, they all have the opportunity to engage with the natural world. Um, so now that I've given you an overview of our work, I'd like to speak more on our holistic approach um, in helping young people feel included and supported in order to establish that long lasting connection with nature. So young people are most driven, most excited and most capable uh, of creating real change when they get to use their voice on their terms. Um, and it's essential we provide support and create experiences and opportunities that allow for a meaningful youth-led movement to flourish. Um, and we do this in a number of ways. The core tenets of our camps, for example, is for young people to discover the magic of nature, to make friends, to just have fun. It's easy to think that we, as switched on adults, um, with an appreciation of the environment, um, all had secure connections uh, to the natural world and really understood environmental issues when we were young people. I know I used to think that about myself. Um, some of us definitely did. Um, but for the majority of us, if you think about when you were 12, were you thinking about climate politics or playing fun games outside with your siblings <laughs> and friends? Exactly. <laughs> um, so we obviously want young people to be excited by nature. So it's necessary that they have access to activities and learn about species uh, that are interesting and relevant to them, while also being able to play games, laugh, and just feel joy. Um, here we are playing Draw the Beak on the Woodpecker. And as you can see from my face, Ambassador, <laughs> Ambassador Zolotoni drew a beak in a particularly fantastic location. Um, <laughs> And whilst this seems like something quite simple, Zolotoni actually really started to take an interest in birds in West London where he lived. Um, and he then went on to start volunteering um, in his local bird nature reserve directly as a result of this game. 
um, is also a very dab hand at bird identification too. Um, on camps, we go on long nature walks during the day where young people learn about the history of the land um, and the human impacts, both modern and historical. We also get to learn and see about the incredible diversity of um, landscapes and organisms from wildflower meadows to deep valleys, insects to marine life. I mean, we really do get to see it all. We go out on night walks where we see and hear bats and spend time stargazing. Uh, last summer, we actually were lucky enough to see the Perseid meteor shower and glowworms scattered across um, the fields. And for all of this, we are gently but constantly encouraging the young people to partake. We make sure that all activities, whether it's practical conservation or a hike or even just a sit down discussion, are explained well, that their young people are introduced to terminology and that we don't fear introducing them to new terminology and concepts, whilst also being mindful to approach topics in a way that does not alienate or put off the young people. Um, campers also experience hands on conservation whilst volunteering. Um, they become citizen scientists and experience truly magical moments um, as a result. Um, and then we then sort of juxtapose these traditional sort of old school activities um, with our non-traditional approach in campaigning sessions, uh, leading young people to identify their motivations, uh, reflect on their values, and ultimately reinforce their connection to nature. Now I could go on about um, these things because I love our programs, obviously, um, but it's probably better if you hear what a young person says. So this is Fatima, who was on camp a couple of years ago, uh, and Fatima said, camp gives you great opportunities. You make great memories and have so much fun. My camp highlight was stargazing. Um, it was so nice when you all saw the shooting star at the same time. This was a particularly beautiful moment because all of the young people were completely silent. Fantastic for me. <laughs> um, and in the silence, um, if they hadn't been given that um, time and encouragement, they generally would not have seen the shooting stars. Um, and hearing that audible gasp um, and that feeling of awe was a really lovely moment. So yeah, all of this comes together um, to create an environment where young people can feel confident in engaging with nature, can feel safe in it, and importantly, know that they are amongst others who share their passion for it so freely. Um, and that's our way of helping young people feel included in conservation. If you'd like to find out more about our work or you'd like to contact me, <laughs> um, these are my details. Um, and I think that's my time, so thank you very much. You actually couldn't have been any more on time. That is spot on. So we actually have time now for questions. So I don't know if that oh, he's doing something. Oh, there <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Uh, so, so for Omar, um, how do you ex how do you approach explaining things like terminology so as to not alienate people? Mm, so I think it's very easy to use big words uh, and then to quickly move on. Um, but it's really important that you check with everyone in the room that they understand the word that's just been said. So I'll often stop myself, and this is something we'll do, we'll stop ourselves and say, does everyone understand what that word means? Now with young people, they'll often all go, yeah. <laughs> and you say, okay, who can tell me what it means? And then so silent, you can hear a pin drop. <laughs> um, it's really important at this point to be encouraging, to remind them that this is not a test, this is not an exam, that wants people who do not mind what they say. Um, could they just attempt giving an explanation as to what that term or concept is? And you find very often that they pretty much get it. It's just about the confidence to, to say that and to know that they're in a space where they won't get judged necessarily. Um, once that's done, we then will move on to other things, but we often will try and make sure that if something does need to be explained, it comes from the young people themselves. Um, Young people do not want to hear older people talking all the time. <laughs> um, and if you can get encourage them to learn from their peers rather than having to always learn from someone who power-wise, age-wise is above them, um, it creates a much healthier dynamic within a group um, and a much nicer space for them to feel like they can just ask whatever they want. Thanks.
thank you all. This is very interesting and uh, important, of course. Um, Omar, you mentioned that, and I think actually others touched on it as well, that uh, so young people can be quite, I guess, fearful sometimes about going out into the natural environment for various reasons. Some of it uh, is obviously about kind of geographic access. So you, 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 we all talked about that, how far it is maybe to get, difficult it is to get away into the country. A lot of uh, wildlife are, are in people's you know, back gardens or parks. So I'm wondering also what you think of how, how much of it's to do with how parenting has changed and maybe how, and this is going to sound like an old man, but how people have changed, how they, like, play has changed for children. Now they're on screens, for example. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I think probably all of us could answer. Um, so I would say that, um, just speaking from a personal perspective, um, when my grandparents um, came to the UK back in the 60s, my grandmother had carried with her um, a lot of preconceived notions about wild spaces and the kind of people that occupied them. Um, she came from a very upmarket part of Cairo and um, to her nature, if it was managed um, and if it was controlled by humans, it was not something to fear. Um, whereas if it was a wild space, um, only certain people of a certain class or background um, belonged in that space and that sort of was passed on from her to my mother uh, and then to us as well um, and I don't think this is just a personal thing often many people I know growing up were often raised with the same kind of ideas about nature um, if it wasn't seen as a maybe a dirty place it was just seen as a waste of time um, you had better things to be getting on with whether that was revising for exams or things like that um, and I think that that sort of cyclical nature where it's passed on from one generation to another, um, it's it's quite easy to miss that it's even happening. Um, and I think that that's sort of been compounded by the fact that we are a technology generation, as you saw. Um, and um, it's become very easy now to um, just say, oh, well, the outdoors isn't as safe as being inside. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it's like a very multifaceted answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there is a thing in parenting um, where the, the natural world isn't seen as safe. Like there's the um, like probably the amount of times um, younger people are like they're they're going they're searching around um, for stuff and they're told that that's dirty. Um, uh, like it just kills off a child's curiosity probably immediately after that happens um and i think as a society um i might be just speculate i'm speculating horrendously here but i think there's probably some truth to it um we've become quite fearful um you don't see kids roaming too far from the house anymore our streets we felt we we definitely feel a lot less safe um and i think or or even if we're not we're we're still safe parents have become a little bit more paranoid. Um, uh, and I think that probably has impacted um, that danger should be controlled, um, risk should be avoided um, at all costs. Um, but I think, uh, so I do think that that probably has had uh, quite a large impact because nature is wild, it's unpredictable. Um, nettles do sting you. Um, and you can, um, and if you eat something that you shouldn't have, you might get poisoned. Like there, there are the risks there, but with proper education, um, you can then absolutely cancel out those. Like you only need to be told not to eat a yew berry once, um, or five times. Mm -hmm. Just please do not eat those berries. Um, I, like tell that to your child, and they probably won't eat them because children, whenever they're given warnings, whenever they're young it's a part of the human learning experience. They take them on. So whenever you say that all of nature is dangerous, it's very quick. All of nature is dangerous. If you just tell them don't eat the yew berry, it becomes that you can actually explore this place a lot more safely. Yeah, um, I'd like to, yeah, 
great, great um, comment to me, but um, just two things. One is that um, I grew up in London. I grew up in a council estate in like zone five. Um, and we had a brook running behind the estate. Um, we also had like some fields and Uxbridge Canal and all of these kinds of things. And every summer, you know, everyone, you lived in a council estate, it's just you chuckle the kids out and they just play out the front or out the back and everyone would jump over the fence into the brook. And that was completely fine. And that was really lovely. And actually the time, a time in my life where I was maybe the most connected to the natural world. I don't know, the most freely connected to the natural world. And I was remembering these just memories of playing in the brooks um, and the way that the council estate was built was that there were patches of green space around. And then I was telling somebody about this and then looked on Google Maps just to show them. And uh, it didn't exist anymore because it was a, a, bu a building development. Um, and so I think it's yes, parents and yes, all of this, but also where activism comes in because we're just seeing spaces that, yeah, might not be like a nature reserve, right? That brook might not be on anyone's radar, but it was actually a source of immense joy and exploration for kids who, yeah, didn't have time to be thinking about the natural world or to be thinking about conservation or anything like that. But the natural world was a kind of escape for those children as well, who were living like, who were all living quite hard lives. So I think partly it's that, it's about like how focused we are just on the nature bit um, and not on all of the other things that intersect um, and that kind of restrict access outside of the whole, like bring people into these natural spaces, but actually, what are the natural spaces around people already that might not be, you know, majestic or might not be so kind of alluring, but actually are like really great touchstones. Um, and I did have another thing, but no, I've forgotten it. Um, I'll say it later if it comes back up. <laughs> so this is a question from online. Um, what do you see as the pathway to making nature accessible to all people? Couldn't have asked a bigger question. <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> um, do you have a... I, the look I mean, of I, panic. I was, thinking, I was thinking about this um, probably a few months ago now. Um, so in a past life, I used to stock check uh, sheep um, which a lot of people are surprised to hear about that you can do in South London. Um, but I used to visit a beautiful nature reserve called Saltbox Hill. Um, and every week I would check on the sheep, make sure they're all healthy. Um, and the thing that I realized was how safe I felt in the nature reserve. It was a very under visited place. Um, you had very few people coming in. And if they did, it was normally just to walk on the paths with their dogs. Um, I was ecstatic the first time I went to see the sheep and um, I told my grandmother about it and she was just like oh yeah I know that place I said what do you mean <laughs> I, I, I thought I was bringing her news about this fantastic <laughs> place near us um, that she had not realized and she's like oh yeah I used to walk past it all the time back in my nurse days at BTC and I thought well, why didn't you tell me this um, and she said, why would I go walking through a field by myself on the way to work? Um, and it sort of made me realise that something that I took for granted, which was just always feeling safe in this space, um, was something that sh she just never would have put her, she would never put herself into a situation like that, especially back in the day. Um, as a lone young woman, you would not do something like that. And I think safety is the big thing. Um, to feel like you're in an area and that no harm will come to you. Um, and that's not just from her perspective. If we think about young people living on an estate, for example, um, what might seem like just an, uh, uh, a natural space which um, has no good or bad um, attachments to it can actually be a very unsafe space where um, people feel like they can't linger in in case something bad happens to them. Um, it's a place they cannot pause and just breathe in. You know, they have to make sure they're either indoors or they're quickly on their way to their destination. Um, so yeah, I would say safety um, and the feeling of that is probably the big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, apart from like the big old elephant in the room that we just need more um, green spaces mm -hmm. just in general. Um, and I think um, I think also the education aspect um, probably could, is worth highlighting again, um, just because like if 
you had actually been told about the space, you probably would have been there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think also is, is quite important the fact that um, we there might be green spaces around, but you have just no idea where on earth they are. Um, so I think the education aspect, going into school saying, there is in fact a green space near you that you can visit um, is probably also there mm. as well. It's a big, it's a, it's a big question though. Mm. Should I find to say something? Okay. Yeah. Like I, I've done talks like this before and I think what I've learned is when people say, well, how do we include these particular groups? And I feel like now I've learned this concept, this can't, Every time <laughs> this conversation about barriers, it comes up a lot and it's not really the way to think about it. And I think the way I learned is you should bring opportunities to people, which City Girl Nature, she's great. She talks to me about it rather than like breaking down these barriers in the sense of like, I kind of think, OK, transport, OK, you've reduced it, but you still have to pay for it. So it's sort of like that just doesn't really work. You can't just be like, oh, I'll make it a bit cheaper. You come to me. You need to bring these opportunities to these people. You need to actively include these people, not kind of just flip-flop and kind of just try to do a little bit. You need to actively do something about it. And I think that's the better way of having conversations about it. Got it that time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Next question. We've got an another question from online. They love us online. I do. Uh, so this question is... Um, could you speak a little bit about how parent cl class or wealth, uh, so being unable to support young people into opportunities has an effect on the lack of diversity of young people in, in natural spaces? I think I'm understanding that in the sense of like, I think I have met other parents where like they, I'm not a parent myself. I've met parents where they, I think, struggle to bring their kids because they have to work every single day. They're not like these parents who can, oh, I'll bring you down to this estate I'll bring you here I'll bring you there they don't have that time and I think I was at um a youth summit where I gave a workshop and this kid had a really good idea which I mean as long as GDPR but he sort of had this idea of having chaperones where you have people maybe it could be a version of action from spatial or something like that where they can take kids to these nap these spaces because simple fact is not everyone can afford to not work you know that's why you have a lot of people in natural spaces who are retired the rest of us will have to work all the time every day and that's no different for parents. So I think a big thing is maybe having ideas like that, maybe it's not the perfect solution. That's another thing I think a lot of people overlook as well. So I think that's a really good question. Did anyone else have something to weigh in? Um, I mean, I guess, yeah, just just in, in the same way, like growing up, my mum like had three jobs and didn't have a lot of time, but actually this is just weird. She worked for John Lewis Partnership and John Lewis Partnership would always do these like trips to places that you could just take your like families on and I think that kind of copying that model creating space and, and that's what we did like when we had the summer holidays like she'd go through like every single like free thing that was happening somewhere and be like right go like that's on now go and I think that having these things that parents can rely on and having them like access to parents whether that's through school and getting put in mm. rucksacks and just saying okay here like here's everything or whether that's outreach from different NGOs actually like putting some funding or like prioritizing funding in the budget to I don't know, have a van come and pick people up in a certain area or to do these things where it's like the burden doesn't necessarily have to be on the parent and the opportunity is there for people to just access them. Um, yeah, just just sort of in a less pointed way of like, are you interested in nature and more like, here's some childcare? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Go on. <laughs> um, it was a quick observation and then a question. Uh, the first one, I just wanted to respond to what Joycelyn and Dara were both saying, because um, it really uh, resonated that I think the times in my childhood when I sort of built the passion that has carried me through in, into the career that I went into, um, and I was very lucky to have the opportunities that I did, um, but it was when I found things for myself. It was when I was able to just explore and I felt I discovered it for myself. And so part of that does speak to what we've been going over a lot, which is, you know, the access to the space and feeling safe in it means that you can then just allow them to go and have those exploratory experiences. But at the same time, what I've discovered since um, doing a lot of work in, in environmental education is that you can have that process of exploration and discovery in a hedgerow or in a tiny patch. And I remember taking planning an hour session with a load of school kids where they just had this tiny urban school 
yard really with a tree in one corner and a, and a little raised bed and I thought god I've got to fill an hour and there was and there was another little patch around the corner but actually I spent the hour and I didn't get all the way around <laughs> because basically I spent so long around this one tree in the end and we had we found you know an oak goal and we found and then as soon as you've given just these few little tools and these few little ideas of like if you look closer there are these things to find wonder about what they might be because the answers are going to amaze you and then the kids were kind of going off and they they went off apparently um uh the school created a, a free exploration session for them to basically go and try and find uh, this was the next week to try and find some of the things that i talked about because i'd left these materials for them and apparently they just spent another hour just out there like just screaming across the yard to each other about things <laughs> they found so I just thought like it is, I think um, some of these problems can feel insurmountable when we look at the situation now, the cost of living crisis, the urban build up, the, the lack of access to green spaces, and they need addressing, but we also want to be able to make progress in the shorter term. Mm -hmm. And actually there are ways that we can do it through education, through inspiration. Um, but my question is about something completely different because that was just my <laughs> intersection. Um, so we talked a lot about like putting the foundations in place that we wish were in place 50 years ago and had never gone away. Um, but looking at where we are now, we also, I think, want to pull from the top as well as push from the bottom. So I wondered if any of the panel had any thoughts on uh, things that um, conservation organizations that are focused on conservation rather than on the social side, um, because it's a fantastic that we have organizations like Action for Conservation that have come up to really push where it's needed and to create those opportunities. But there's organizations um, that are science-based or conservation-based that want to do more they feel a bit uncertain and there's various things that we know are possible like creating uh, youth board members, um, creating um, bursaries and uh, internships that are ring fenced for underrepresented groups, things like that. I wondered if we could have any reflections on things that you have seen work or things that you think could work that could be done more. Mm -hmm. Um, my answer to that would definitely be utilising the tools that young people are already using. Um, I think often if you're coming from a top-down approach, there's a tendency to prescribe what the young people will be doing and how they're going to do it. Um, and uh, a really good example of this is the use of technology. There's an abundance of identification apps that you can download, and I'm sure some of you probably already use. Um, I know that once I downloaded them, it really just opened up the world, and you were just talking about sort of the magic of the world in just a hedgerow or something like that. Um, it's a really impressive way, I think, of engaging young people um, in a way that they understand. Um, and it's important not to be set in ways and uh, feeling as though if you want to engage young people, they have to do it the way you did things. Um, so for example, I'm working with a school in Brixton at the moment, and we went on a, a uh, on a hunt to identify as many different species we, as we could. Um, extra points if you could get the full Latin name using the Seek app or the iNaturalist app. Um, and they found King Alfred's cakes and a humongous olive tree growing off Brixton Hill of all places. Um, and that was back in January. I went back to the school after almost two months and I asked them as a, to remind me what happened. And I was expecting them to remember absolutely nothing. And they were able to Remember the King Alfred's cakes, they could recount the, the story, the folk story behind it, exactly why they were called that. Um, the olive tree, um, the magpies, and the mythology associated with it. Um, and some of them had even downloaded the apps since on their phone and were using it around South London. Um, and I think it's just a really nice way of giving them the tools um, to do things and also copying the tools that they already have um, in order to get them involved. Yeah, I think sometimes it's really easy to kind of get caught up with what's going on either internally within an organization or more broadly in terms of conservation prioritization. Obviously, when you're like working within these organizations, you're working on your own projects, um, it's really easy to become sort of blinkered about what's important and how work is done. And I think one of the big things about being someone either from an underprivileged background or um of a different gender or a different race is that it feels like people focus more about getting you in the door than on keeping you there or keeping you there in a way that like honors your personhood. And I think a huge thing is around humility and also about tolerance of discomfort. I think um, 
having a diverse group of people working in a place will inherently lead to discomfort because these young people are very knowledgeable and are a lot prouder about their backgrounds and a lot prouder about the information that they knew than I was at, at, at a younger age um, because it I think it because of social media and because of technology it's become actually something that you're not going to be the only one in a room talking about or no or having knowledge about but actually it's it's something that you feel confident to talk about and so I think that when young people do raise concerns or do maybe challenge the way that things are done or challenge the way that they're spoke to spoken to or challenge um maybe some histories of the organizations that they're working with or practices of organizations they're working with that systems for the tolerance of discomfort um, are really really necessary for those people to continue to feel like they have um, positive well-being within those spaces and that actually that that those moments of discomfort actually build so much trust and make people feel super supported and that like they're there as a community and a collaborative effort to push the field forward than a sort of like you're here but kind of on our terms um and just to add I did remember the thing and it kind of links back to what you're talking about around education and as someone who's like does education all the time I'm really passionate about education but I was speaking to um the writer and author Catherine May maybe some of you know her um and we were talking about this part of um her book um, enchantment that she wrote where she had dragged her son out to go for a walk and you know Kathy May's a nature writer she loves nature she you know wants her son to be imbued with this information and this knowledge and she's walking and she's you know, pointing out everything and naming everything and trying to get him involved and he's sort of reticent and like not engaging so then it sort of she just bec becomes silent and they just walk quietly together um and then he sort of comes out and says, you know, whilst we're walking through this space, it feels just like a million branches are coming out of my head. And every time you talk, you cut off one of them. And it, it, <laughs> it's harsh, but it also does say that thing about the letting people discover things on their own and also about how education is um, sort of given in, in the sense that sometimes someone is not giving you the reaction that you think that they should be having, but actually they're being impacted in so many ways and creating a safe space for them to be able to share those things or just experience them personally, I think is um, is really important. And, and that can happen again within organizations too of people really finding their feet within their own research, but then the kind of top-down approach really limiting and cutting off these branches that maybe they were really excited about. Are we allowed any more? I think we probably managed one more. Uh, yeah, that, that, guy, that guy over there has been putting up his hand for the past <laughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> You've made his day. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm personally wondering about the gravitational pull of this room. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> there's been a lot of people going over that side. Um, <laughs> thanks, everybody, uh, for your contributions. It's been great. I, one of the things I think I struggle with, and um, possibly everybody else in the room, is that I think we all get and want to contribute and make a difference to this scenario. But we're probably in the worst position to do so. So and my example here is that I've, I've got a really good friend of mine. He's Bangladeshi. He runs my local curry house. I have lots of conversations with him about my, uh, my work and what I do. And he sort of takes the mickey out of me saying, if I go home and tell my parents that I wanted to become an ecologist, they would tell me to get out of there. So what I'm interested in is how, how can we, as a, 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 a collective, like we all get it, how can we collectively convince and get over those barriers that are there? And, and by recognizing the barriers, feel confident and not bothered that by, pointing them out that that's a problem. We're not being racist by saying there's barriers there. What we're doing is acknowledging them and saying, how can we get over that? How can we get everybody thinking that and solving the problem together? Question. Yeah, I think there's a few things there. Um, Cause obviously, yeah, there's the cultural barriers as well as the barriers that are imposed by the field itself. Um, but I think there's a bit of a cycle that goes on and coming from a background where like, yeah, environmental stuff, not necessarily gonna like put you on the best track in life is because 
black and brown people are less likely to have opportunities in life and so also the field needs to make it attractive to be part to be part of the space and that's not necessarily a kind of um explicit DEI thing but it's like how many opportunities are posed as like free things to do as opposed to things that can actually be paid a, a little bit and I think it's not necessarily that people don't have that interest but it's it's that maybe the rewards are different or are presented as being different so I think there's a huge cultural shift that needs to happen where the, the field moves away from a certain just cultural association so whether it is amplifying and remunerating people of color in different uh, cultures that can actually present the benefits of this work or prevent present the joys of this work I think that's really important I think often that people of color in this space end up having to do a lot of emotional labor in order to outreach or to like connect with people of their own culture within the space and I think that um that in itself is part of the problem because it it, it then puts the labor on on them and of course they are better to do that job in sort of more one-on-one -on -one, um interactions but then it, the hope is that it would seem as something that's like valued and and that is um yeah really part of a wider strategy um so that's just one one sort of idea yeah it does it is uh it is probably the biggest one of the biggest pressing issues for ecology and i think coming on to the um the point that it's like i was i was actually just thinking about ecology how many positions are volunteering um, I'm just going to put that one out. Ahead. It's, it's, you've got to have an end to actually get a job. You will need to have done probably a year or a year or two unpaid internship. You're going to have to do like five different volunteering positions. That's like almost um, a, a, because you're a young person, it's probably like a quarter of your life spent doing unpaid work, labor, like unpaid labor. Um, to help um, older people who are getting paid for this position and the people who are being paid are obviously people who've actually managed to progress which are usually not are the represented groups in that area and I think um, we get the reaction of why would you ever want to work as an ecologist because you've got to have you've got to leap over these barriers you've got to duck and dodge like you've got to um, nobody wants to um, go into a field where you're expected to just sort of, I don't know, magic money into the air. Like <laughs> it's a real, real struggle. And if you want it, and then other things you might need to get, like you need to get a degree. It's there's just the, all of these areas that are just feel. Um, and I think yeah, the volunteering does seem to. We have a volunteering epidemic. In a, and I and it's not like that in any other field. I, I it does seem to be a, an ecological problem um, that the volunteering. Unfortunately, that's why I think a lot of volunteers are retired because they have the time. Yeah. they have the money. I mean, I'm I have to get a job soon, and I'm master's you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for another internship, and it'll be my third. Yeah, when, when will I get the job? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. When did it? When did we actually make up the idea of an internship, a job before a job? like no. that feels insane yeah and on that note your placement students please pay them properly please, please pay. and if you've got like youth councils and stuff and they've done so many hours pay them please it's not a brag <laughs> it's a bit disappointing so i think yeah. that is a really really good point and i think mm -hmm. as well just on a generational level like my grandparents are immigrants and my mum she's worked at a bank for almost 40 years and i you know now live in a single parent household but now I'm generous where I'm actually able to do that. Granted, I don't think my grandparents will ever understand what I do, which is fair. It's just not enough folks to do that. But I have the privilege now, even though it's just my mum supporting me, to be able to do what I do. And I feel like a lot of us, we only got here because of us. Like, we literally clawed our way to this position. I, I literally earned three pounds an hour when I was on placement. I'm not joking. And so I think there's something also to be said of, like, we worked bloody hard to be here where yeah. we are to, even today. So yeah. another reason why I love this panel as well. So <laughs> um, but no, no. Like just very quickly, go, I go, think, go. Um, we have such a dearth of environmental jobs. Um, if you think about um, back in the day, how many councils had a biodiversity officer or a landscape manager and things like that, um, there was 
not always, but there was at least some sort of pathway that you could envisage. Um, and now there's so few jobs that it's become sort of a, is it crabs in a barrel? Is that the term? Where everyone's sort of fighting each other for very few um, roles and positions. Um, and that sort of reinforces that notion that you should be volunteering for years and years before you expect to, you can expect to get into a, a job like this. And I think that's where it links to your question. I know that for my grandparents, for example, and my mum especially, it wasn't necessarily that you know, she had any sort of issue with nature. It was just she could not envisage um, a stable path for me for the rest of my life if I went into this sector. And it's about challenging that notion um, from, you know, helping young people challenge that within their families. But it's also sometimes about having that uncomfortable conversation with parents if you are able to get them in a room um, and and feel confident enough to challenge that and look at the benefits and make it clear what those benefits are. I know my mum was really, uh, she really placed a huge amount of importance on education for us and um, if she had known that um, we could have learned such a huge amount about the world um, through jobs like this and being in this sector, I'm sure she would have been less hesitant um, and less worried about me um, coming to a sector like this. Mm -hmm. Very quick then, to come back on that. Oh. Sorry, sorry, Matt. I don't know Round two. Oh. <laughs> very, very quickly. As an employer, mm -hmm. I, we're the, we come from the completely different side of that. We, we're desperately trying to recruit people that are conscientious and disciplined and determined to do do their bit. Mm. And our problem is the, the cohort of people we get to choose from. So it's I think the, the, the problem comes from between children at primary school, which you've very eloquently talked about, a number of you, and, and degree level, that we don't want degree, you know, if, I, if you gave me an 18 year old that was diligent and conscientious and, and observant, I could train them to be a brilliant consultant ecologist within two or three years, mm. way better than their contemporaries that will come out as a degree, uh, as a 21 year old mm. degree. The problem is what we get is graduates and what we don't get going into those degree programs is people from a diverse background. Mm. So we're struggling to recruit that diversity because that cohort simply isn't coming through. Mm. So I think our problem is working out where that apprenticeship level should be, where we can take some sometimes those 16 year olds and can have those conversations with their parents and say, look, just trust us. Like there is a, you know, <laughs> these people have made quite a lot of money doing this and they've made very good careers out mm. of this, but we will make those happen. Mm. Um, but it's, I don't know, the problem we have at the moment is not knowing where we can recruit and where we need to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a marketing problem because I remember uh, at, absolutely. at school when we would have like, um, people coming in uh, a lot to talk about not just jobs or degree stuff, but just apprenticeships and things like that. It was always finance and technology that were like coming in and saying, you know, we can get you on board, we can, you know, selling themselves basically to students and I think that it's about like I remember someone coming in who had been an alumni and saying you know if there's one thing you need to do it's learn how to code and then I decided I was like okay I'm fine. I'll learn how to do that and I think that at that 16 to 18 age people are really thinking about what the heck they're going to do with their future and if you can come in there into schools and talk face to face to children and be very convincing and charismatic about the field then you you will get some takers but yeah i think it's that kind of marketing side of it as well. one useful thing you could do the government has uh publishes a spreadsheet um of all schools and uh it has multiple bits of information including people premium percentages within a school if you sort of create a short list of schools either local to you or in like a reasonable distance <laughs> with which have high people premium percentages um contact the school by the reception or SLT, whoever, um, and really push it. Like I was saying earlier, schools are under-resourced, um, understaffed, heavily stretched. Um, but if you find the right, you'll often find in schools, even those overstretched teachers, there'll be someone who will give just that extra bit of time to try and um, engage with someone from outside if it means bettering the lives of the children that they're working with. Um, it's a slog, but I've for me, that's like a surefire way of getting mm. into a place like that. I want to say as well, just because as a university student who needs to now get a job, go to these job fairs as well. I think we've had so many sessions and 
days where they come to these sorts of jobs, there's never anything environmental. It just doesn't exist. And so when they say, well, we want to help you, but no one actually knows how to help you because no one's done anything environmental or have a mental, but she doesn't do what you do because no one does what you do. So you, where, where do I find these? I think that's something I really found when I came back in placement. Finding opportunities really sucks yeah. because it's so hard to find them. And it really, really aggravates me. Aside from making a newsletter, because I just thought if no one's going to do it, I'm going to do it because I don't care anymore. Um, finding opportunities is really hard. And I think issues in this sector is very, is very like, it's exclusive. Is that the word? But like, you know, it's who you know. And so I think you need to just bypass and do what, you know, Omar said, it's like, go straight to them, go to these universities, go to these schools. You know, not everyone has the time to check 10 trillion different websites for a job. Just go straight to them. You'll be the Holy Grail. Yeah. Come to University of Brighton, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, that did remind me um, whenever um, you're talking about going to these job fairs and there's just nothing there. It's, and it's, uh, even the people who might be able to hire um, people in ecology seem to also not, because the National Trust, um, this is genuinely hilarious and also tragic. So I walked up to the National Trust and was like, I want a job. They were, and they were like, we can only vol offer volunteering opportunities at the moment. And I was, this, it gets worse. Um, I, I then say, I want to go into conservation. And they were like, oh, like the conservation of buildings. And I was like, no, of like animals. And they were like, what? This is the National Trust. <laughs> they own the parks. <laughs> and I was just like, help <laughs> and there that was the closest i got to yeah. it at a job fair at school it was deeply tragic and i was so sad i was just like my one hope the national trust mm. has failed me <laughs> uh yeah it was come on guys do more <laughs> building conservation yeah. i want to hear no more complaints about how much volunteering i do now after this conversation so, <laughs> so i think we actually oh we've got pub quiz later guys yeah it's to be we follow yeah. <laughs> Matt, telling me, telling me off now. Yeah. Well, I also say thank you to the panel for being here because you guys, I mean, I don't think I could have picked better people to be here today. And I know I'm biased, but you guys are amazing. So I want a big round of applause. I'm not asking, I'm telling. <laughs> and if we want to find any of us, is there any way that people can find you? Or do you want people to literally? come find you after this to contact you <laughs> if they would like to. Um, I'm bashing off that after this, but you can either email me at, j at joycelyn at climateandcolour.com or at climateandcolour on everything. I um, have a website that you can look by searching up on oh, my, really my name. Um, you can probably find me there. Um, I might, I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm the same, guys. I don't think many people have my name in the sector, so... <laughs> And Strong one on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're sharing a thumbnail. Plenty of our names. <laughs> I think you'll be easy. And I do want to lastly say, because I am here as a representative of UK for Nature, so I have to give them a shout out. Imagine they're here virtually. I want to say a big thank you for them to support me for being here today, because obviously they've given me such amazing opportunities, and I love them very much. All right. <laughs>